Well, good afternoon and welcome to this SCI webinar on the chemistry of CO2 and its role in decarbonisation. Um, my name is Mark Harrison and as chair of the SCI's Energy Group and on behalf of the Society of Chemical Industry, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join this webinar, the first in a series of three. And for those of you who aren't already aware of the, uh, the SCI, I'd encourage you to visit our website and that some details are shown on the screen. Uh, SCI is a charitable organisation founded in London in 1881 and it operates at the interface between industry and academia to foster innovation, members networking and development and to contribute to the public understanding of science. And I think particular relevance today in the area of decarbonisation, SCI publishes three significant journals, Greenhouse Gases, Science and Technology, Energy Science and Engineering and Biofuels, Bioproducts and Biorefining. I hope you'll find today's webinar valuable and I'll now hand you over to Rhys Edwards who will chair today's proceedings. Please. Good afternoon everyone. My name is Rhys Edwards and I'm Secretary of SCI Energy Group and as Mark mentioned I will be chairing today's session. I'd now like to welcome you all to this webinar concerning the chemistry of carbon dioxide and its role in decarbonisation which has been organised by SCI's Energy Group. Today we have a fantastic lineup of speakers to present on this topic. These include Professor Michael North from York University, Dr Alison Moore from Nottingham University, Kevin Chown from Q Technology and Professor Peter Hammond from CCM Technologies. This is the first of three webinars in this series and the subsequent events are scheduled on the 29th of October and the 5th of November. I'd also like to introduce my group colleagues, Mark and Geraint, who are going to be helping to coordinate the Q&A session following the presentations. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of today, Professor Michael North. Since 2013, Michael has been a professor of green chemistry within the Green Chemistry Centre of Excellence at the University of York. His research interests are focused on chemistry and green solvents, carbon dioxide utilisation, catalysis by earth crust abundant metals and the synthesis of polymers from sustainable feedstocks. In addition to publishing over 200 papers and being a named inventor on six patents, he was awarded the 2001 Descartes Prize by the European Commission and the 2014 Green Chemistry Award by the Royal Society of Chemistry. In his presentation today, Michael will be discussing the combustion of fossil fuels and proposed methodologies for dealing with waste CO2. As well as this, he will provide an overview on his own work on the synthesis of cyclic carbonates from waste CO2. If I could now hand over to you, please, Michael. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and I hope you can all see, see my screen. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be here giving the, the opening uh, lecture of this three-day uh, symposium and what I wanted to do today was, was talk fairly generally about sustainability and the role that carbon dioxide has in ensuring a sustainable development for the chemicals industry. So on the first slide I thought I'd show you the green chemistry building at the University of York. This is the Green Chemistry Centre of Excellence. It's bright orange on the outside but I can assure you it's very green on the inside. And as you can see on, on this photo, we are a grouping of about 90 people. And I can assure you this photo was taken before any rules on social distancing were introduced. So what is sustainability? And there's been numerous definitions over the last 20 or 30 years. And perhaps the, the best and most recent is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals developed in 2015. Um, and signed up to by just about all United Nations member states. And I would argue there is a role for chemistry in absolutely every one of these. Most people will focus on number 12, responsible consumption and particularly production. But I think for this series of seminars, climate action is particularly important. So is affordable and clean energy. And to me, life below water and life on land are all about avoiding pollution uh, to avoid uh, causing damage to those. So I think as you look through these, you can see that chemistry is, is central to most and has a role to play in every one of them, um, but particularly down here in the bottom left-hand corner. This is, if you like, the standard and I think rather boring way of presenting these United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
I quite like this representation, although it doesn't uh, display quite as well over a, a computer, but it does very nicely link the, the goals to the three pillars of sustainability, whether it's financially sus financial sustainability, society, uh, so being socially sustainable or environmental sustainable and it shows how the the goals are distributed around these three pillars I think this is a rather a rather good representation of of how the goals fit into sustainability in general so I would argue that the big problem we've got in modern society from a sustainability point of view is that we live in a linear economy and by a linear economy, I mean we take resources out of the earth, we make something out of them, we use that something often only once, and then we throw it away and it causes pollution. And that's not sustainable and is causing many of the major problems that we're, we've, we are becoming increasingly aware of that are down to, down to mankind in, in the 21st century. So to me, there are issues at the original taking end of this in that we are using up resources far faster than they can be replenished and there are re problems at the pollute end of this that we are causing pollution on a massive indeed global scale um, that we've got to stop doing and start doing something about. So the alternative would be to move from a linear economy to a circular economy and in a circular economy you make something and they ideally before you make it, you design it to be unmade at the end of its life. But you make something, you use it, you reuse it and you keep reusing it as often as you can. When it's when it's impossible to keep reusing it, then it's been designed that you can remake it or repair it. Once you can't repair or remake it anymore, then it was designed in such a way that it can be broken down into its constituent parts and remade either into the same item or into a different item, which you can then go around the circle with it with again. And in a perfect circular economy, there is no waste and the resources that you're using are the waste from a previous cycle. So there should be no overall consumption of, of resources. So I would argue that the biggest challenge for humankind at the moment is to move from this linear economy into this circular economy. And a really good example of that that's very relevant to this series of seminars is how we generate energy at the moment. Um, because at the moment we, we tend to get energy by burning fossil fuels and so we extract fossil fuels from the ground whether it's coal as I've shown here or oil or natural gas we use them, i.e. we combust them once, and then we dump the waste, the vast quantities of waste carbon dioxide at the moment, virtually all goes into the atmosphere, or we might be thinking of dumping it underground with carbon capture and storage. And of course, there are two major problems with this. And one is shown on this slide, and that is that by dumping ever increasing quantities of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we are directly raising the Earth's temperature. And I've shown you in the bottom right hand corner what's probably the most famous graph on the planet, which is the increasingly close relationship between the level of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere shown by the blue line and the increase in the Earth's temperature shown by the red line. And you can see that since about 1950, then there's an increasingly good fit between the red and the blue lines. And also from about 1950, 1960 onwards, then the blue line, the slope of that has increased markedly as, as uh, urbanization and, and as development has, has, has really taken off. And the other problem with this way of generating energy is thinking about the supply chain of a, of a linear economy. Oil and gas are non-renewable resources, at least on the time scales that, that as, as humans we think about. And in addition to generating energy from oil and gas, over 90% of all commercially available organic chemicals are sourced from crude oil. So if we run out of crude oil, we not only have a major problem from an energy perspective, we have a major problem from a chemicals perspective as well. And 
every year BP produces a statistical review of world energy, and I don't want to get too hung up on these numbers because they're almost certainly wrong. But nonetheless, just as a, as a guide, they do show or they do indicate that known reserves, and I emphasize known reserves of oil, will be consumed in 50 years. The same is true of gas and coal will last for about 132 years. And there's an underlying assumption in these predictions, and that is that the consumption of fossil fuels remains constant at current levels. Now, I suspect this year is going to be a unique year in that consumption will have gone down significantly, but in general, consumption of fossil fuels has increased every year since about 2008. So it's likely that these are overestimates rather than underestimates of how long known reserves will last. The takeaway message is that we need alternative sustainable starting materials for the chemicals industry. And I would argue that carbon dioxide is a sustainable feedstock. We will never run out of carbon dioxide, not unless we all stop breathing. And it's the current generation of, of, of scientists and of, of people in general who really have a decision to make. Do we want a planet that looks like this or do we want a planet that looks like a green and pleasant place to, to live? So where does all this carbon dioxide come from? And up till now, I've been emphasizing the role of energy production. So burning coal, burning natural gas. You can see by burning coal, we generate 14,000 million tons of carbon dioxide every year. By burning natural gas for fuel, 6,000 million tons. But the chemicals industry also is a major producer of waste carbon dioxide whether that comes from oil refineries, from cement production, from ethene production, iron and steel production, natural gas, and I've shown at the bottom ammonia production in blue, simply because when you look at the purity of the carbon dioxide that's produced as a waste product from the ammonia industry, it's 100% pure. And so to me, that's the low lying fruit uh, that you would want to go to first and use the pure carbon dioxide before worrying too much about any of these other sources where the carbon dioxide purity is much lower. And of course, ultimately, we could go to the atmosphere. And when I put this slide together, atmospheric carbon dioxide levels were around 410 parts per million. And that means if you do the mass that there's about three teratons of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, and it's freely available to anyone who wants it anywhere on the planet. It's delivered free to your door. You don't have to pay a delivery charge. You don't have to pay someone to make it for you. It's, it's available for free. So what are we going to do with all of this waste carbon dioxide? Uh, we can't go on putting it in, into the atmosphere. Um, and there are essentially three, three possibilities. And the one that most people have heard of is carbon capture and storage. And this involves capturing the waste carbon dioxide, purifying it, pressurizing it, transporting it through a pipeline, and then burying it deep underground in, for instance, depleted gas fields or depleted oil wells, or indeed in geological uh, uh, features. The problem with this is it's an extremely expensive process and there is no product that you can sell at the end of it. You're literally just dumping the carbon dioxide underground. And therefore, it is always going to be very bad for profit. It's always going to be financially unsustainable. However, it could be very good for the environment because you're taking the carbon dioxide that would otherwise end up in the atmosphere and storing it away. But it's a continuation of this linear economy because it's treating carbon dioxide as a waste of no, of no value. Now, even worse than carbon capture and storage is enhanced oil recovery. And enhanced oil recovery is almost identical to carbon capture and storage, but it involves dumping the carbon dioxide not down a depleted oil or gas well, but down a partially depleted oil or gas well to force even more oil or gas out of the well. 
Now, of course, oil companies like this because it's very good for their profits. They can make a lot more money by selling this extra oil that they can extract from the well. But all that oil is going to end up being burnt and producing lots more carbon dioxide. So potentially this is bad for the environment and it's potentially a very dangerous pyramid scheme if the extra oil that you're forcing out generates more carbon dioxide than you, than you in, inserted into the well in the first place. And the really bad news is that when you look in the, in the press, every scheme that's currently being touted as a commercial carbon capture and storage scheme is actually doing enhanced oil recovery. So I would argue there's a third option in the middle, shown in green, and that's carbon capture and utilization, which you'll see abbreviated as CCU or CDU. And this truly treats carbon dioxide as a resource. And so it's good for the environment because we're converting the carbon dioxide into something, but it's also good for profit, for financial sustainability, because there is a saleable product at the end. Now, one big problem you have to address with carbon capture and utilization is the scale that's, a, that's the scale mismatch between production of waste carbon dioxide, which is about 36,000 million tons every year, and the potential market size for chemicals. And on this slide, I've just shown you some of the larger scale chemicals that we make, which are potentially available from carbon di dioxide. And at the top, you can see carbon monoxide. We make about 344 million tonnes every year. You can clearly see that that could come from carbon dioxide, and that would require 540 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. Sounds like a lot, but that's 1.5% of all the waste carbon dioxide that we produce in a year. And then you can see that ethene would consume about 1.1%, ethanol 0.4%, and the three I've shown in blue at the bottom of this slide, urea, methanol, and inorganic carbonates, these are already commercial. We already make urea, methanol, and inorganic carbonates from carbon dioxide, and you can, but you can see that they're consuming 0.3 or 0.1% of the waste carbon dioxide. And in fact, if you add up every chemical that you could make from carbon dioxide, you would only need about between four and 5% of the waste carbon dioxide that we produce every year. So people often say to me, well, why bother if it's such a small contribution? But of course, what that's overlooking is that you can also convert carbon dioxide, not, not into chemicals, but into fuels. And carbon dioxide to methane, which is natural gas, this is the Sabatier reaction. This has been known since the 19th century. Carbon dioxide to methanol is commercial, but with carbon dioxide, with carbon recycling international in, in Iceland, and they're now building a much bigger plant in, in China. Carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide, I've just been talking about from a chemicals perspective, but of course that carbon monoxide, you can then do Fischer-Tropsch chemistry on, and you can make liquid fuels out of that. Equally, once you've got methanol, then you can do methanol to hydrocarbon ke chemistry well established and you can make fuels, liquid fuels that way, or you can dehydrate the methanol to dimethyl ether, and that is a drop in replacement for, for diesel. So potentially all fuel, all liquid and gaseous fuel could be made from carbon dioxide and hydrogen, and this would utilize the other 95% of waste carbon dioxide emissions. So then people say, okay, but then shouldn't we just concentrate on making fuel because that's, that would solve 95% of the problem. Well, the problem with that argument is when you look at what happens in a current petrochemical refinery, then the situation is very similar. So I've shown you on this slide that about 70% of crude oil, the circle shown in green, is converted into transport fuel of one form or another, whether it's for air transport, motor vehicles, rail, whatever. Another 26% is converted into non-transport fuel, household fuel, um, oil. And that leaves just, a, just between three and 4%, which is used to drive the entire chemicals industry. But now look at where the profit comes from. 
because that three to four percent that goes to chemicals produces 42 percent of the profit for the oil refinery almost exactly the same as the profit that they make from from uh, transport fuel so only by making both chemicals and fuels together can you be both financially sustainable and environmentally sustainable you need the chemicals for the financial sustainability you need the fuel for the environmental sustainability and that brings me to the concept of a carbon dioxide refinery uh, which we pu published last year where you would take waste in pure carbon dioxide whether it's from the atmosphere or from a point source you use carbon capture to refine that into pure carbon dioxide and then 95 percent of that pure carbon dioxide you would convert into fuel using renewable hydrogen from water and renewable energy and that would provide 50 percent of the profit for the carbon dioxide refinery the other five percent of the carbon dioxide you would combine with other renewable feedstocks from waste biomass to make a wide range of chemicals which you can sell and they would provide the other 50 percent of the profit and this is a true circular economy approach to carbon dioxide utilization. So just to finish off, I want to show you a little bit of, of what we've been doing. And to put it in context, this is the reaction between ammonia and carbon dioxide to make urea, which I mentioned is one of the already commercial processes. In fact, this has been commercial since 1922. Even older, commercially is the reaction between phenols and carbon dioxide to make salicylic acids this has been commercial since the 19th century and at the bottom of this slide i've shown one which isn't yet commercial but which basf are are very interested in which is the reaction between ethene and carbon dioxide to make acrylic acid and if you notice these are all exothermic reactions now the particular reaction we're interested in is the reaction between epoxides and carbon dioxide which again is a highly exothermic reaction. It's already a commercial process. It was first commercialized by Huntsman in the 1950s, but commercial processes use high temperatures and high pressures of highly purified carbon dioxide, and they also use corrosive halide-based catalysts. And if you do a life cycle analysis, then what you find is that the need for these high temperatures and high pressures generates far more carbon dioxide than is consumed by the process. So at the moment, this is a net producer of carbon dioxide. But if you could find a good catalyst that would let you do this reaction at, at or close to room temperature and at or close to atmospheric pressure, then you could convert it from a net producer of carbon dioxide to a net consumer of carbon dioxide. And the reason why cyclic carbonates are important, they've got many applications, but the one that is particularly important and is a particular growth area is that they are components of the electrolytes used in lithium ion batteries and lithium ion batteries power the world these days whether it's your mobile phones and i'll say that plural your ipad your laptop computer and indeed the electric vehicles that we're now producing so over the last I guess 13, 14 years now, we've been developing new catalysts for this reaction. And I'm just going to show you our most effective class of, of catalysts, which are based around aluminium complexes of this sail and ligand. They're very easy to make, and we know exactly what the structure is because we got the crystal structure. And you can see they have this bimetallic structure where the aluminiums are shown in green, and there's a bridging oxygen here in red. And this is what they will do. These are batch reactions carried out at atmospheric pressure, one bar of carbon dioxide at room temperature for three hours. And every terminal epoxide we've ever tried, we can convert into the corresponding cyclic carbonate under these conditions. And that includes ethylene oxide and propylene oxide to form ethylene carbonate and propylene carbonate. And commercially, these are the two most important examples. We then immobilize these catalysts onto, onto silica to give us to go from homogeneous to heterogeneous catalysts. And we showed that they retained their catalytic activity. And then we've been able to use those supported catalysts in a gas phase flow reactor 
And now, so now switching from batch to flow mode for cyclic carbonate synthesis, which had never been done before. And we were able to produce cyclic carbonates continuously over a period of a week or more. We were also able to team up with Deuce and Babcock um, and look at using real power station flue gas for this chemistry. And we made a big batch of catalyst and split it into five. One batch never left our lab, that was the control. The other four batches were all exposed by Dusan uh, to flue gas from either burning gas or coal for up to 16 hours. And here's just a diagram of the Dusan power station test facility that they have just outside Glasgow. And there's no scale on this, but this burner is about the size of a three-story building. And this is the only time I've ever had to do chemistry wearing a hard hat, one piece overalls and steel toed boots. Safety specs were optional. Uh, but what Dusan very kindly did was let us drill a hole in their chimney over here, stick a pipe in, and we were able to siphon off their flue gas at the rate of about 20 mils a minute. We know exactly what the composition is because this uh, rig is covered in sensors and they also told us what the composition of the coal was. And the takeaway message is when you compare the control with the 16, the sample which has been exposed to burning uh, coal for 16 hours, there's absolutely no difference whatsoever. These are turnover frequencies in, a gas, in our gas phase flow reactor over 12 days. And so the, all the impurities in the flue gas had absolutely no effect on the catalyst whatsoever. So where are we with this technology? And I thought I'd put it in terms of technology readiness levels. So just to finish off, if we go right back to the beginning, to the days where before my hair went gray, then to get through technology readiness levels one and two is very easy and very inexpensive. You just need to have a good idea um, initially of a concept and then to put some detail on it. I then had a PhD student who in the first three months of his PhD was able to synthesize this catalyst and to prove that it was catalytically active and that gave us our first patent. And here's a typical reaction that he had set up, but I think you'll agree this doesn't look much like an industrial process. You'd need a very big balloon if you wanted to scale this up to, to millions of tons per annum scale. But on the basis of that, we then got two postdoc grants and were able to, as I've already mentioned, convert it into a, a, a gas phase flow reactor based system. We're, we're able to make the immobilized catalyst and we're able to test compatibility with flue gas. That took us another year. On the basis of that, we were then able to get a large grant from the European Union and to collaborate with uh, teams of chemical engineers really all over Europe and do a lot more work and we were able to scale up the synthesis of the catalyst. Here's a number of samples uh, of it uh, put in bottles spelling out CO2. We were able to do all these studies that chemical engineers immediately asked us to do of the effect of temperature and pressure on catalyst activity. The chemical engineers were able to go away and do their design uh, studies on what a, a process would look like and we were able to do both experimental and calculations on the on the catalyst as well and to design the first industrial test plant which at the end of the EU grant Carbon Recycling International then built in Iceland so this is an industrial mini plant this now looks a bit more like something you might see in a commercial setting and we provided them with 300 grams of catalyst to go in, the, in here. This again is a flow based system. And as you can see from these bottles, they were able to produce liters and liters of cyclic carbonates uh, whilst running this reactor continuously. So where we are now, I would say is at about TRL level seven. The technology is now licensed and designs for a prototype and full scale plants have, be, have now been drawn up and funding is, is being sourced. So I'm hopeful that in the next year or two, that we may have the funding in place and indeed be able now to, to, do, to start construction on the first full scale plant. That would get us to TRL level eight, at which stage the technology should start to make some money. So that's all I had to say. It just remains for me to thank the various people who've been involved in this chemistry over the years, 
in green are postdocs from my lab. Adrian Whitwood runs the crystal structure service here in York. Some of our international collaborators and the various people who've provided us with money at, at different times to do this. And to thank Peter and the other organizers for the opportunity to come here and to give this lecture today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Michael. It was very interesting to hear your thoughts on the role that carbon dioxide could play in a circular economy, as well as your research on catalysts and how they've progressed through the various TRL levels. So we wish you all the best of luck with getting to TRL level eight. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Alison Moore. Okay, so Alison is an energy, energy social scientist in the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Nottingham and has 17 years experience working on the role of energy and environmental technologies as enablers of social and environmental change. For the past 10 years, she specialised in energy systems governance in different socio-cultural and political economic contexts. Alison is the first social scientist appointed to the UKRI BBSRC, Bioscience for Renewable Resources and Clean Growth Strategy Advisory Panel. And Alison has advised several bodies, including the Science and Technology Committees of the House and Commons and Lords, the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, and the Committee on Climate Change on Bioenergy and BEX Governance. In her presentation today, Alison will draw on science and technology studies research, which, is a beam, which has been applied to CCS and bioenergy social science, and will identify pertinent lessons for the government, governance of BEX. So if I could now hand over to you, please, Alison. Thank you, Rhys, uh, for the introduction. And I'd also like to thank the SEI um, for the opportunity to present today as well. Uh, just one little caveat, I've actually simplified the presentation due to time, uh, so I won't be going into the difference between science and technology studies and social science in general, and I'll just present a general uh, social science perspective uh, to these issues. So I just wanted to start by giving a bit of societal and governance context to the lessons that we can learn from uh, bioenergy and carbon capture and storage uh, social science for the governance of BEX. And begin with uh, the fact that international and national uh, emission scenarios that limit future global warming and meet the aspirations of the parent Paris Agreement rely heavily on the deployment of bioenergy with carbon capture and storage at significant scale. And so understanding the broader ethical, political and governance issues will be critical to how societies view the acceptability of BEX and its social license to operate. And I just wanted to begin by showing um, some examples of these scenarios. And I have two here from uh, the Committee on Climate Change, the CCC. And the first figure 5.2 shows estimates of greenhouse gas abatement uh, per tonne of biomass used in various sectors, considering the most appropriate counterfactual. And it shows how abatement is broken down by sequestered carbon and displaced carbon. And we can see that the amount of CO2 stored due to BEX technology in various sectors features prominently uh, in this graph. And this also maps onto the CC's hierarchy of best use published in the same report, where after construction, the next highest priority goes to BEX. But this will only be possible with efforts to demonstrate and roll out the technology starting in the 2020s, uh, says the, the CCC. And it's also conditional on bringing in tighter rules on biomass sourcing. The second figure, 4.7, and here we can see that the CCC has constructed four UK biomass supply scenarios, pulling together different assumptions about domestically produced and imported feedstocks. And these scenarios result in a total UK biomass resource in 2050 of around 100 uh, terawatt uh, hours per annum to 300. And achieving the higher end of that range in a sustainable way is likely to require a number of preconditions to be met, including strong sustainability governments and international cooperation, significant amounts of land for growing energy crops, in turn requiring a favourable socio-economic context, 
and or high levels of innovation in technology and agricultural strategies. And it will also require significant amounts of investment and policy support. Societal perceptions too are important here and a number of recent studies have shown that uh, it's not going to be all smooth sailing with BEX. Here we have um, a screen capture of a graph from the recent Climate Assembly UK report, The Path to Net Zero. So you may be, most of you will be aware of the Climate Assembly that took part um, earlier this year. The, the Assembly members, they brought together 108 from across the country. Um, and here in this graph, you can see that in the case of, if I can get my laser pen working, uh, bioenergy with carbon uh, capture and storage, that only 42% of assembly members strongly agreed or agreed that BEX should be a uh, part of how the UK gets to net zero, while 36% strongly disagreed um, or uh, strongly disagreed or disagreed. So not too much of a difference there. Common concerns expressed um, about BECs by the participants included the potential for leaks from carbon uh, storage sites and a feeling that they failed to address um, the problem, including a risk that they are treated as a magic solution that takes the focus off the amount that we are emitting in the first place. Assembly members also saw these methods as being less natural, costly and unproven in terms of the technology uh, they require. And whilst BEX and DAX received limited support, some assembly members uh, were keen that further research and development takes place, noting that these technologies could perhaps be uh, then used more in the future or that they might be needed to mop up remaining CO2. And again, uh, some recent uh, research done on public perceptions uh, by the Energy Policy Research Group uh, based at Cambridge on behalf of the UK Carbon Capture and Storage Research Centre. These results were published by uh, David Reiner back in May. And here we can see that BEX and bioenergy support um, both up slightly from the year before, but they still uh, trail uh, other solutions. Uh, low levels uh, of awareness of, of carbon capture and storage, as we can see here, which was another finding of that particular survey, may be a contributing factor. And we can see that international research and societal attitudes uh, to carbon capture and storage generally highlight storage as the most contentious part of the CCS chain. Uh, and Lorraine Wheatmarsh has led one of those projects. Also, there's lower acceptance of CCS by people living closer to storage sites. There's also evidence that offshore storage may be more seen as more acceptable. And also the acceptance of storage is dependent on national policy context, local industry and identity, and perceived risks and benefits, therefore a social license uh, to operate. And a social license to operate is broadly defined as an informal permission given by local communities and broader society to pursue, a, uh, to pursue technical work. So we're starting to see the scale or the significance of the scale of the socio-technical challenge here. So the perceived need to implement BEX systems at significant scale is not just a technical challenge. Uh, Goff and Manda, for example, say that there is an urgent need to integrate research into the social and political implications of large-scale bioenergy with that relating to CCS, taking analysis of BEX beyond the separate literatures. And Patricia Thornley and I, uh, a few years ago, also discussed delivering genuine negative emissions with a sustainable use of biomass at scale presents new and complex multi-level governance challenges, not least in how negative emissions can be accounted and assessed, making explicit the underpinning value judgments, in how we prioritise competing resource use, and in how we defer responsibility for storage and local impact trade-offs to future generations. And making such a significant energy system transition is a huge undertaking that will require appropriate governance. But lessons drawn from bioenergy and CCS social science show that 
uh, existing measures fail to take account of the human dimension and local impact trade-offs of these technologies. And I'll just discuss a few of these. So from a socio-technical perspective, um, work by uh, Miller, uh, Charles um, Clark Miller, sorry, um, and colleagues at Arizona State University has discussed um, this perspective and what it involves. Thus, the key choices involved in energy transitions are not so much between different fuels or technologies in our case, but between different forms of social, economic and political arrangements built in combination with our new energy technologies. So in other words, the challenge is not simply what fuel to use, but how to organize a new energy system around that fuel. So how should we configure those social, economic and political arrangements around BEX so that it can be deployed in a way that delivers sustainable uh, global greenhouse gas reductions? And it's clear that we need to consider the whole system or supply chain. And while such a comprehensive scope of system may provide consistency of comparison of, en of environmental impacts to other generation technologies, does it make sense from a governance perspective? And so here we can see a whole uh, supply chain perspective, and this particular figure illustrates the scope of the typical bioenergy system for analysis. And it's relatively easy to justify the inclusions of different stages um, if the objective of the assessment is to gain a true perspective of the environmental impact of the whole system, including its supply chain. So the environmental impacts of including or excluding different steps can be significant. So, for example, should the scope of the system end with CO2 storage? Is it enough to produce CO2 that can be stored or should pumping, storage and leakage all be taken into account? Similarly, looking at the top left hand corner in land preparation, does it make sense to include this? But without appropriate land and agricultural inputs, the biomass will not grow. However, for the purposes of my talk today, the question is not so much whether there is a physical link or a process um, between the different systems elements, but how the system behaves as an entity from a governance perspective. So what form should this system take? What is needed to ensure appropriate development and governance of BEX in a way that does actually deliver its objectives? And in answering that, one way to, to look at this is to ask what does this relatively flat or one dimensional representation omit and what are the missing dimensions from a governance perspective. And so the dynamic interaction, so Beck, sorry, Beck supply chains um, are more than just kind of a flat representation or a supply chain. What we're dealing with are complex socio-technical systems and the dynamic interactions between these heterogeneous components necessitates the consideration of a broad range of impacts beyond the environmental consequences of mitigating G, um, GHG emissions to include the assessment of the wider socio-economic, cultural, political and ecological impacts of BEX across the entire supply chain. So from this socio-technical perspective, systems perspective, two analytical dimensions are often overlooked in technology and policy assessments of bioenergy and CCS. And these are the spatio-temporal dimension and the human dimensions. And both of these raise a number of key questions with implications for Beck's governance. The first of these is, is the scope of the system ethically justifiable for combining carbon sequestration and emissions occurred in different countries and sectors? And also, what are the lessons for Beck's governance of the spatial and temporal ordering of bioenergy technologies and the uneven distribution of their impacts. And finally, how could an extended analytical focus to encompass the social, human and spatio-temporal uh, temporal processes of BEX deployment and consequences help shape its governance? And within each of these questions, we are embedded um, value judgments and values underlie, uh, tend to underlie public preferences uh, to do with energy such as efficiency, nature protection, safety, uh, reliability, affordability, freedom, fairness, quality of life, etc. 
So social acceptability is therefore dependent upon embedding these values and identifying necessary trade-offs in the social, economic and political arrangements around BECs. So BEX systems, first of all, are spatio-temporally ordered. That is, the spatial order assumed in visions of BEX systems is distinctly global, as we saw from the earlier graphs and figures. So UK targets for bioenergy use assume a system of international trade in biomass commodities, such as the raw and processed feedstock or even the value-added biofuel. And poorer southern countries exporting raw biomass for use as value-added energy products and services uh, in the richer north, we see here an example of what is known as an environmental load displacement because the environmental burdens are being borne in the poorer southern countries, uh, but the richer northern countries are benefiting from the value-added fuels. And there are issues of equity and social justice, um, questions of uneven uh, spatial distribution related to where biomass has come from and which regions have borne the negative impacts and which have benefited. And separating the emission and removal of CO2 spatially and temporally further increases the ethical implications, particularly in terms of inter and intragenerational justice. And in a globalised bioeconomy, national supply chains will inevitably interface with adjacent systems such as agricultural systems and forestry systems and wider networks and markets. And so the spatial ordering of BEC supply chains therefore needs to be interrogated uh, to ask more fundamental questions about sustainability beyond those considered by quantitative modelling or sustainability indicators in order to identify areas where potential conflicts may arise at the intersect of either the North and South and global and local territorial contexts. And there's just a, a simple example of a, a representation of the spatiotemporal ordering of biomass exported from Tanzania uh, given there. The BEC systems also uh, have a human dimension and the successful implementation of BECs is dependent not only on the techno-economic and environmental processes, but also on social processes and their consequences, thus its human dimensions. And we can see that models conceptualize systems as collections of technologies and their interactions and understand transitions as changes in consumption and production patterns, technologies and resources. But this tends to overlook the role of institutional and socioeconomic innovations, human technology interactions, and understanding the effect of social and cultural practices and routines on systems change. And we also see that environmental change practices and systems often fail to address institutional, social and behavioural barriers to change, all of which are vital to understanding the different ways in which humans value, use, interact with and depend on natural resources. And so value-based visions of bioenergy have highlighted concerns about the difficulties of monitoring large scale supply chains, the potential for the distributing, for distributing impacts unfairly and also of competition for biomass in the global economy. And we've also seen public concerns related to CCS that are not simply down to knowledge gaps, but have to do with differences in values and how the public tends to frame risks or potential risks in different ways compared to uh, experts. So a recurrent criticism aimed at bioenergy governance has been its inability to consistently and comprehensively respond to the full range of externalities linked to bioenergy production. This is in part because EU policy has delimited bioenergy specifically as a low carbon energy technology and not a process or alignment of internet interconnected processes. So accordingly, governance of bioenergy has focused on delivering end products such as bioelectricity or biofuels without providing steering on preferences for feedstocks, places and practices of production. Uh, etc. So in other words, without assessing the complex global supply chains and their wider impacts that constitute the final product. And it can be argued that sustainability certification criteria established in the EU RED, for example, 
and subsequently imposed on the UKRO and RTFO encompasses sites and modes of biomass production, but these are quite narrowly focused and many aspects of agricultural practices, conversion, uh, distribution and end use are not included. So again here, the numerous interfaces with other systems along the length of biofuel supply chains, including and especially agriculture, are not envisaged by the specific policy focus on bioenergy or biofuel as a low carbon energy technology. And this has implications for bioenergy governance. So, for example, many of the controversies and negative socioeconomic and environment, environmental impacts related to bioenergy and CCS identified in this presentation arise at the interfaces with adjacent systems and are products of the complex relations between the heterogeneous human and uh, non-human elements of supply chains. And so a whole systems governance of BEX is about moving beyond carbon myopia to develop hybrid policy solutions to match the complexity and breadth of sustainability issues raised. And by bringing the whole socio-technical system as opposed to just the end product into the purview of governance, this opens up opportunities to negotiate, uh, to not only regulate the techno-economic components of the supply chain, but also to be responsive to specific ways in which these components interact with humans in different contexts and at different times. But again, how can we achieve this in practice? Whilst the figure here by Perkis and colleagues is referring to the uncertainty brought about the numerous technology feedstock combinations possible in bioenergy, their recommendation for balancing planning security with adaptive flexibility is, I would argue, equally applicable to balancing different choices and values between different forms of social, economic and political arrangements to be developed in combination with BECS. And a key, a key lesson for BEX governance arising from the overlapping cases of bioenergy and CCS is that policy measures must be sensitive to the heterogeneity of local contexts and to distant spatial and temporal impacts. And so, for example, policy and fiscal uh, interventions such as regulations, prices and other incentives may need to be individualised. But these alone are still insufficient uh, as drivers to establish new BEX systems as they overlook the role of people in shaping energy and climate systems. So balancing policy flexibility and the ability to respond to new societal uh, developments and changes in public attitudes needs to be weighed against policy stability underpinned by firm expectations and planning security to provide market actors with the safeguards and confidence they need to invest. And the inclusion of a broader range of stakeholders and therefore values in decision making processes along the length of the supply chain and at the interfaces with adjacent systems as a core guiding principle for BEX governance would help strike that balance as well as balancing other trade-offs. So just to conclude, a multi-level governance approach is needed that prioritises people as well as carbon emissions, and that is sensitive to spatial and temporal impacts to bridge the gap that exists between global strategies, national policies and everyday actions. And we also need, there is also a need for understanding of socio-economic innovation and human technology interactions to inform the development of BECs in tandem with technology and engineering advances. And finally, we need to develop hybrid policy and governance mechanisms for developing BEX systems at different scales and that are sensitive to spatial and temporal impacts. And I would just like to finish by acknowledging uh, the various sponsors and funders of the work that um, has gone into or that underpins this presentation and most notably a joint paper published uh, with Patricia Thornley uh, back in 2018. And that is it. Thank you. Thanks very much for your presentation, Alison, and your thoughts on the governance of BEX. <laughs> okay, so I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Kevin Chown. So, so Kevin is a founder of Q Technology, whose technology cost effectively converts low grade feedstocks into clean pressurised syngas for hydrogen, chemicals, fuels and other applications. 
Kevin has worked on the development of advanced gasification technology since 2012. And in 2013, he directed a successful engineering project funded by the Energy Technology Technologies Institute, as well as the subsequent 16 million pound continuous operation demonstration project known as the Sustainable Energy Center. In his presentation today, Kevin will provide an introduction to Q's advanced thermal conversion technology and its application to CCUS. He will also discuss how modularized ATC technology can create a pathway to both a zero carbon and negative carbon future. So if I could now hand over to you, please, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you for the invite, and particularly for, for Garant, for the, for the contact uh, for here today. Uh, we're more engineers than, than chemists, uh, but thank you for letting me join. Uh, I think we share a common mission to apply these skills to the betterment of, of society and tackling the issues that we're talking about today about sustainability. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, circular economy, particularly the carbon cycle and the contribution that advanced thermal conversion technologies can have. Uh, in combination with, with CCU and CCUS and CCS. Um, also the potential to play a role in a key role in, in BEX. Uh, we heard in the last presentation from Alison a lot of uh, detail about the complex system and, and the challenges there. Uh, so what I'll be talking about is one technology piece within that whole uh, uh, old system. I'll mention a few times about sort of pathway and journey and I think it's very important to consider how we actually make steps that count and demonstrate and move on to the next uh, the next step. So and we hope to you know as a result of this to have further discussions in terms of uh, potential collaboration with industry partners, research and uh, public bodies. So a little background about um, uh, Q technology. Um, our mission, uh, if you like, is to uh, uh, close this gap, and there's a technology gap here which I've illustrated on this um, screen, um, concerning uh, we have a waste, increasing global waste problem, but yet we also have a, an increasing demand for, obviously, for, for sustainable energy. And uh, currently, you know, we, we can burn waste, we can incinerate it, uh, only producing some steam, uh, some heat and electricity, uh, and there's a gap there for technology that can use efficiently convert that into a into clean energy vectors, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, CO2 will be in there, of course, as well. Um, and a technology that's compact and cost effective and clean. So this was identified a, a number of years ago by technologies in Energy Technologies Institute uh, around 2010. Uh, and, and we've uh, worked significantly uh, with them since around 2012 onwards in the development of our um, technology. So the uh, opportunity there is to make use of a very large range of uh, uh, low-grade feedstocks uh, and to produce, as I said, hydrogen and carbon and monoxide and CO2, which can then be onwardly used in multiple different applications, uh, whether it's initially heat and electricity, hydrogen, fuels and, and feedstocks into, uh, into chemical production and other uses. So just a little bit briefly about what our particular approach to the advanced thermal conversion uh, technology is, is uh, we have a, a pressurized fluidized bed gasifier. Uh, fluidized bed gasifiers can eat virtually any feedstock you put in it to within reason. Uh, and our plant is pressurized. This gives gains in terms of being compact, enables it can be to be built into factory built uh, units. Um, it can be then deployed to site and gaining uh, economies of scale through serial manufacturing and also increased efficiency uh, as a benefit of all running at higher pressure. Um, we have a technology that uh, um, cleans the sink gas and critically cracks the tars uh, to break them down into, into the simple molecules of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. Critical also is that that sink gas at that point is consistent in its composition. Um, some gasification processes have had an issue whereby uh, with different feedstocks, a uh, varying amount of plastic content, for example, the hydrogen ratio is varying and that really precludes what you can do usefully with that uh, gas stream downstream. Um, also, of course, you know, by, by having a, a clean um, thin gas with a higher concentration of CO2, uh, it's more cost effective to then remove that CO2 and use it for multiple applications, uh, such as uh, you know, some of the other speakers have spoke, spoken about and, and will do with the rest of the uh, rest of the seminars. So um, a few of the takeaways in terms of our process. 
and some of these apply to other advanced thermal conversion too, is a wide range of feedstock flexibility. Um, this is important from a commercial point of view because we can start with the uh, high gay fee residual waste later as, as, as recycling behaviors change, etc. Uh, it starts to take biomass waste in, in, in the future. High pressure operation I mentioned. Our plants are modular, which means that we can get units out there uh, quicker and with lower uh, construction risk. Um, cleaner at clean emissions because the, uh, the, the, the syngas is, is a product, it's not a waste at that point. Um, and um, we're already we've already proven our done initial operations at our plant in Wensbury. Um, there's a few basic shots there. I'm always a bit embarrassed by the big uh, pitch on the left hand side. It, it is that bar plant was built as a stick build plant. It's too big. Uh, the next plant's to be a lot more um, compact. Um, but um, yeah, it's an operating plant. And our next our products that we'll be uh, uh, rolling out are the same process scale as this plant. And of course, that has been the uh, you know key bugbear, key, key problem in in many not just gasification, other technologies too, um, in terms of uh, scale up risk and then uh, jumping from a small scale prototype to large scale plant. So our next plants are modular built versions of this one. I'll very briefly give a, a, a um, uh, set that in context in our history. Uh, as I mentioned, we've worked uh, a lot with ETI over since around 2012. We're very grateful for that support. Um, and their co-funding of, the, uh, de of the demonstration plant in Wensbury. Um, as you see, we, we've worked with various government departments on, on grants in terms of around uh, hydrogen and, uh, and fuels, which are very exciting uh, opportunities for this uh, technology. Um, we are, um, the next steps for us is, is to start deploying those modules in industrial applications um, initially uh, even straightforwardly as seen gas for in industrial for industrial high temperature pre process heat um, where uh, we embed the the plants on site and an industrial clients uh, provide seen gas to displace natural gas but of course by doing that you start to provide a roadmap whereby when it becomes commercially viable to to shift to hydrogen and capture the co2 then that can be done with with, with additional uh, additional equipment but in the initial point of course is that the initial deployments have to be commercially viable and cost effective for the customers. So again, I come back to this point about uh, stage, uh, stage deployment that's viable at, at each um, stage. We're working with various industrial clusters southwest of that country and uh, some starting some good conversation with others too. And we'd very much like to, to uh, develop those further. So enough about Q, I'll just sort of more broadly about uh, advanced thermal conversion, you know, uh, because of the, uh, which I include other gasification, but also pyrolysis and similar type uh, technologies, all of which are targeted at uh, uh, converting feedstocks, low grade feedstocks into um, energy containing products, uh, gases or other products in the case of pyrolysis. Um, and by being able to be ready for uh, pre-combustion CO2 capture, then that starts to, to, to enable that to the vision there, the circular carbon vision that we've got on the, on the, on the right hand side there. Um, and the, the ability to co-locate, I think, with industries um, is very important. It's being at staged, staged approach because we can be, uh, these technologies can be cost effective and viable if they are co-located uh, with such industries and consumers of both the energy products and also uh, we hope in, in uh, and this is the point of this, these sorts of seminars in terms of the, the CO2 as well. Uh, we're, we're developing a circular economy by using um, local feedstocks and ultimately you know the background of this of course is, is as a country uh, we have to take responsibility for our own our own wastes. I think everybody would agree that's the direction we have to be heading um, and longer term enabling the the, the BEX vision uh, by this circle then enabling us to pull more biomass supply uh, in, into the mix by providing a value the best value for that uh, uh, that feedstock um, I think also as I mentioned before you know, the product value uh, in the products that the industries are producing can provide that driving force for that for that circle. So we're not just relying, you know, this is not just about relying on the carbon tax pulling, driving that circle, but also the uh, uh, the best value in in the products uh, at each at each stage to get that wheel, uh, that virtuous wheel going, as it were. So. Um, 
a brief, brief uh, point about CCU and CCS. This is obviously not my expert here at all, but um, clearly uh, CCS is, is, is needed in terms of the uh, huge bulk uh, capacity to, to sequester CO2. Uh, uh, but as, as, as mentioned earlier, Michael, the, uh, you know, it, it's profit harming, it's, it's costly. Um, and so, and, and of course, also uh, as my context there, it's limited in both in terms of geographical, uh, in terms of the right locations it can cost effectively reach for the foreseeable future, but also in terms of timing, because uh, you know it's going to be a number of years away before those first uh, pipelines are there. So I think that for, for us, CCU is very important. You, uh, um, distributed CCU systems is very important to to, to start. Uh, to start the process of abating emissions and, and proving these uh, models. Um, brief uh, view of what a, 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 a sort of end-to-end -end system, if you like, rather than circular, but uh, uh, where we're taking uh, RDF feedstock and producing those vectors on, on site at an industry and uh, initially uh, capturing CO2 and providing that to existing industrial applications where they're using CO2 uh, at the moment uh, um, from, 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 from current sources. Uh, but we're very much looking and interested in, in innovative processes that, that, uh, that use that um, CO2 to create new products or, or storage in energy efficient uh, ways. I think the Opportunity here, this is where some synergies, potential synergies come in, is that on the ACC side, uh, they, they of course, as well as the CO2, there can be the energy vectors as well. Hydrogen might be needed, electricity, heat, uh, in order to support the, the CCUS the, the technology too. Longer term, okay, in terms of where we're thinking about going down this road of uh, decarbonisation, uh, we, would, we would see that um, um, increasing uh, proportions of biomass, waste biomass, uh, obviously very important in, in with the feedstock mix. Um, and also, of course, then if we're then considering uh, that when CCS becomes uh, um, commercially viable, driven by whatever uh, incentives, uh, then that's when the, the you know, real game changer comes in terms of carbon emissions and uh, sequestration. And previous speakers mentioned the uh, importance and the potential of BEX. Um, as well as some of the challenges. So I'll briefly just here talk about, a, 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 this is an old vision slide here talking about climbing a cliff or climbing a staircase. And I think sometimes when, I, when we hear about uh, you know, some of the visions about BEX, and we're talking about very large scale plants uh, due to coastal locations, 500 megawatts uh, or more, uh, then, then you know, what occurs to us is that's a huge cliff to climb. Um, I mentioned before about process uh, uh, scale up risk. Uh, that's been the bane of uh, 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 many projects, um, air products in the gasification world. The uh, Tees Valley project, of course, is, is quite infamous in, in that regard. And um, so that scale up risk there, that first big step that I've got in that chart, you know, that, that then also creates problems higher up the, the, that, that cliff edge as well in terms of then uh, attracting feedstock contracts to a technologies that might not be proven at that, isn't proven at that scale. The critical EPC wrap, so this is where the, the large uh, industrial player with the big balance sheet stands behind the, uh, uh, the technology and the project uh, and guarantees to the funder that their, their, their finances aren't at risk. Um, so th that, that's, those challenges are very significant and what we'd advocate, so what we're looking at is um, critically by using the same process scale as is already uh, proven, that takes down that, uh, that, that the, the size of a step from a cliff to a, to a manageable step in terms of uh, uh, getting those initial um, plot projects out there. Certainly in our case, uh, I mentioned before about uh, deploying the technology at the current scale at, uh, of our demonstration plant. Um, that's around five megawatt thermal scale, which you'd argue is quite small. Now, how we will be doing that is be ganging them together uh, and that can work quite well economically, but also longer term we are, we will be working on a, a, a much higher pressure plant, 40 bar uh, pressure plant at around 10 times, 10 times the scale. And that's something that can be done at, at a later step um, once we've de-risked the, 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 the first, first one. Um, so 
And of course, the, the, these, these barriers also uh, uh, are particularly important also in the biomass sourcing side as well. We heard from Alison talking about some of the, um, the, how the, the complex systems there. Uh, and you can't just simply switch on a large scale biomass supply chain, I would suggest. So a um, little diversion briefly, uh, just if you humor me just for a minute, just talk about the feedstock side. So. Um, Again, in terms of this uh, uh, vision, how we would see it is there is a gate fee at the moment for residual waste, a nice healthy gate fee, whereas biomass, of course, and biomass wastes have to be paid for. And so uh, the, the commercial viable route to, 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 to climb up that staircase is about the use of, uh, of value, making value out of that, the residual waste initially. And yes, as the costs come down, then of course, we're gonna accommodate more of the biomass, which you will always have to pay for in some, some sense or, or regard. Um, and one of the challenges we have actually, I would just say, is the consumption of residual waste in incumbent uh, technologies. Um, so I just compare there briefly. If, if all we do with uh, our residual waste, but also biomass, and the future is to burn it well we can produce steam and okay you can use the steam for process heat or, or for conversion to electricity but it's a much lower uh, value in terms of carbon displacement than if we were to keep that chemical energy as chemical energy and and, and use it as such and um, in particular if we consider electricity um, recent uh, report from um, university of birmingham group energy research accelerator uh, uh, noted it, they calculated 440 grams uh, CO2 per kilowatt hour and I think this audience will, will know quite how that's significantly above um, uh, current grid average and certainly above future uh, future projections so they're, they're always going to be producing unless the heat is usually used a, a higher carbon intensity vector than we can source elsewhere um, now that's not what is being uh, marketed by the incinerators so I think that's also a question for us so just to finish on that point, what I'm saying is that for, uh, uh, for the, in order to realize the next vision, part of this step process is, is making that most fair use of the uh, resources that, that, we, that we currently have uh, around us. So just thinking then about how, uh, again, about how um, uh, ACC, Advanced Dynamic Conversion and CCUS um, join together. Um, I think, you know, clearly from the advanced thermal conversion side, the CCU, so as if I'm characterizing that as, as compact technologies that can be co-located to, to ATC plants, uh, are very valuable uh, in terms of providing a, a, a route to, to decarbonization for, for industrial clients and others. Um, but just thinking about the, the left-hand side, well, why, you know, for, 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 for carbon, the CCU technologies, why, why is the ATC of interest? Well, one is, I think, is because uh, many of these plants uh, and are viable by themselves, so they we start to be being built, and that, that offers the opportunity. Well, if a CCU technology can come in and co-locate, um, then then a lot of the you know the the, the, the project is already there available, um, and uh, you haven't got the the the, the risk of, of starting that. So you can if you can hook on, uh, and certainly for our plants, uh, the CCU technologies out there, you know, welcome. Consider how can you how can you hook on to to our uh, our project um, in a in a, in a cost viable way. Um, technically, of course, you know it would be high CO two concentration and clean. Uh, and certainly in our scenario, pressurized um, CO2 from the process as opposed to, to, to some of the other uh, CO2 sources from uh, other waste and gas streams. Um, and of course, also, as I mentioned before, about the opportunity to provide other energy vectors as well, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, heat, resources, even uh, you know, personnel, etc., from a plant that would probably be fully manned. So I'm conscious of time. I'm just going to um, finish by noting a few steps and, and, and open up some discussion uh, people, uh, what we'd like to talk to. So I think we've talked about how they're compatible technologies, compatible technologies, um, how we would like to, 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 to interface with others who are developing CCU technologies to see how they can um, integrate and to make the synergies across the both. Um, 
Initially, we're looking for where we can uh, send CO2 now or shortly that we'll be producing from our plants in liquefied form, uh, generally, uh, um, direct into industry, whether that's into concrete curing, for example, a uh, particularly interesting area or polymers production, um, et cetera. Um, and also sort of the open invitation for you know to, to visit our demonstration plant the sustainable energy center um, and that center i didn't explain before a little bit but you know the the, the mission uh, of that plant is to operate continuously to demonstrate the technology but also to operate as a, a test and evaluation site so therefore we have space we have opportunity for slipstream of the syngas uh, to, to, to uh, uh, integrate CO2 capture uh, technologies, et cetera, on that, uh, on that site conveniently located in the Midlands. So, thank you. I think uh, um, I'll uh, finish there and uh, uh, interested to hear any questions. Thanks very much for your presentation, Kevin. It was great to hear more about how your ATC technology is compatible, compatible with CCUS and could aid in its development. So thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Yes. So I would now like to introduce our final speaker of today's session, Professor Peter Hammond. So as well as being a professor of chemical and biological engineering at the University of Sheffield, Peter is Chief Technology Officer and founder of CCM Technologies. He has a background in commercial process engineering development and has a particular focus on the application of carbon dioxide within the food, agricultural and petrochemical industries. In addition to founding two successful businesses, Peter's wider body of work includes patterns for materials, processes and analytical techniques. In his presentation today, Peter will use case studies to demonstrate how CO2 can deliver resource, process and product enhancements which are sustainable in both economic and environmental terms. So if I could now hand over to you, please, Peter. Again, thanks, first of all, to Reese and the SCI for asking me or giving me the opportunity to, to speak today. I think in general, I will be sort of following the theme of the others and particularly uh, picking up on uh, the sort of lead set by uh, Professor North in emphasising the importance of circularity in what can be achieved with CO2. And certainly the, the main technique that I'll be talking to you about today is very much one that is focused on one of the key points that he raised, and that is um, taking materials from their sort of end of life, true waste state, and getting those back into the circular economy. Now, um, most of the work that I'll be talking about today has been carried out via um, a what is now becoming a commercial entity, that's CCM Technologies. And this company was set up originally in 2013 simply to um, utilize carbon dioxide and incorporate it into uh, a range of materials so that we could essentially offset the cost of doing that by creating a material for sale. Now, originally we were looking at fibrous polymer fillers and some heat storage equipment and um, a whole range of other materials, but the one that we've had sort of most uh, rapid uh, uptake on actually relates to precision fertilizer materials. And really, uh, I'll talk you through today really why that's been the case and how by incorporating CO2 into uh, our products, we're able to deliver this sort of cumulative range of uh, process and product benefits. So really what we're looking at is using CO2 to uh, fulfill a primary chemical function within the process, but also to um, allow us to use a range of feedstocks, particularly those that we're gathering from waste and most particularly from uh, orga organic digestates, and then present those in forms that um, we can obtain real commercial value for, so we can sell the product, but also benefit the uh, waste holders at the moment who are obviously viewing a lot of these materials, including the CO2 itself, as actually uh, problematic. Our basic process is very simple. Um, it's essentially a, a capture system where we're uh, reacting ammonia, which is held on the surface of fibrous materials with carbon dioxide. Um, we're then transforming that bicarbonate material 
um, that's formed on the surface of the that's formed on the surface of our fibrous systems uh, into a ammonium nitrate system through the addition of nitrate and um, calcium. The key part of this is not really um, the, the process itself, but it's where we actually source these materials from. So when we first started this work, for example, we were uh, recovering the CO2 from post-combustion gas streams, and we now do similar things, but we're using the CO2 from um, biogas cleanup systems. The ammonia we're recovering from, uh, largely from wastewater, and the calcium materials are coming from ashes and the nitrates uh, from recovered nitric acid from uh, NOx scrubbing. So it's really looking at how we can obtain the feedstocks for our process from waste, drawing those materials back into the circular economy, which is obviously a, a, a neat thing to do, but the driver for that is that it's essentially providing us with low cost materials. So what we're producing here is a system that is able to combine these relatively low cost materials uh, in a um, and, a, and not only just an effective manner, but in one which is consistent above all else, because without that consistency, we can't get real value for the products. Um, as I mentioned, the main one of the main feedstocks for the uh, material are digestates, and we use those as a source of fibrous materials. Um, the ammonia that we use in the process is recovered from primary liquid digestates often from within the water treatment industry. CO2 is either post-combustion or post-biogas uh, cleanup. Um, we prefer the biogas cleanup one simply because obviously it's nicer to work with a much higher uh, concentration and that allows us to export some um, heat from the reaction because as Michael Lord highlighted earlier, a lot of these ammonia CO2, well, all the ammonia CO2 reactions are quite strongly exothermic and that can be beneficial we use either with our own process or export back to um, the co-located technologies. And then the product that we're producing is a pelletized fertilizer. As we go through the process, um, it's a sort of carried out on a continuous batch process is probably the best way to look at it. And, look at it. and as that, uh, the materials move to that process, we're able to add additional components, um, again, largely recovered from waste materials, so phosphates and that sort of thing, that can be used as beneficial nutrients in the end product. So just to quickly highlight that again, uh, we need the organic fibrous uh, or almost particulate materials that give us a large surface area to carry out the reaction on. Um, we're gathering the CO2 from a post-combustion source and the ammonia from a range of waste sources and often phosphates from um, wastewater streams. If we look at that sort of process as a whole, just to see how it's affecting in general terms, the way that we can treat carbon dioxide, obviously we have a, a direct capture step from a sort of emitted CO2 that can be drawn into the process. Because we're um, actually sourcing our materials from such a wide, range of sort of end of life materials. It means that effectively we're piggybacking on previously used materials. So there's a sort of carbon emission avoidance factor going on in our process as well, particularly on the, on the source of the ammonia materials. But also uh, the process itself allows us, one, to generate a little bit of uh, low carbon heat, but also to avoid emissions that would be uh, normally produced by, for example, the uh, digestate materials where there tends to be a lot of ammonia volatilization. So again, there's uh, not just a carbon emission avoidance here, but a, an ammonia emission avoidance too. And then last of all, we're ending up with a range of products that do simply have a very high carbon content, and those are going back into the soil. So there's an, uh, an in, a sequestration element of carbon, which is actually becoming increasingly important, particularly over the last 12 months, as there is more interest in uh, the carbon markets developing. And we're seeing a lot of that in both Europe and ironically in the US as well. But then we move on to the products themselves, where obviously 
it's no good producing a fertilizer unless it is actually a decent fertilizer material. And we've now got six years worth of trial results that show that that is the case. And that we're also able, through the way that these fertilizers operate compared to conventionally produced ones, to see some uh, related emissions that occur during the use of the fertilizer as it when it's applied to the crop uh, actually reduced as well and then ultimately obviously the crops themselves the waste parts of those can be used as feedstocks uh, for the um, generation of the process so it is a there's a, a really basic circular thing going on here which is uh, makes life a lot easier now that's great, but it's probably worth looking a bit at the markets that these fertilizer materials could go into. So in uh, last year, there were some three and a half million tons of uh, high nitrogen fertilizers used in the UK uh, and an additional close to two million tons of phosphate based fertilizers. Now, um, that, which is great, there's a big market there, but importantly, those nitrogen based fertilizers are being sourced from very uh, highly energy intensive methods. And the phosphate materials are being produced from uh, essentially finite resources. And so there's an opportunity for, as people become more uh, aware of the requirements for sustainability to um, ensure that these materials, um, basically the, there's an opening in the market for more sustainable materials. Now the um, greenhouse gas approach uh, burden associated with the nitrogen fertilizer is, is quite well known um, and in the UK that's looking at around 20 million tons of CO2 equivalent a year but globally globally up about half a million ton, half a billion tons. Uh, phosphates are obviously much lower but then that's a finite resource um, but it still has a significant uh, greenhouse gas impact in its own right. Um, and also, as I mentioned, those uh, resources are finite um, and potentially running out mid-century, particularly if uh, the limits of um, heavy metals contained in those ores are uh, continue reduced as they are being at the moment. And, and with both materials, there's a, a substantial problem that when, as they're delivered, as they're currently delivered to crops, um, they are, there's a significant amount of wastage and somewhere between uh, 40 and 60 percent of the nitrogen delivered to crops doesn't actually go anywhere near a plant which is obviously unfortunate large quantities of it being volatilized or simply washed out um so are, is it realistic to resource these materials elsewhere well i think certainly that in the case of the nitrogen there's no two ways about that that it, it is viable um it's and interestingly a lot of these structures are already in place so um, it's possible to capture nitrogen from certainly all the human sewage waste systems, but increasingly uh, the nitrogen is available at the diverse, in terms of uh, certainly geographical spread, food waste treatment plants throughout the UK and also the larger agricultural operations. So there's significant um, feedstocks available there. Um, and again, similar levels of, well, not similar levels, but uh, significant quantities of phosphates can be recovered by similar routes. Now, obviously not all these materials are available, but I think it's important to note that the way that the, uh, particularly the, the biogas generating facilities that have been spread throughout the UK, what those are doing is actually agglomerating the, what, the were, what were diverse resources and literally spread all over the country. They are making those essentially into hubs from which they can be recovered and re-exported for relatively local use. So there's a lot of sort of benefits that can be associated with the recovery of these materials. But the big thing is you have to be able to produce uh, products that are consistent in quality and of high uh, uh, and um, uh, and basically and do deliver real results. And if you can do that, then there are significant prices available for these materials. Um, but in addition to um, the sort of conventional reclaiming parts of uh, using the CO2 in the process, we're actually able to stabilize a lot of the ammonia that's held within the feedstock. So 
not just the ammonia that's reclaimed from the liquid streams, but there's also quite uh, often significant levels of ammonia held in the digestates that we're handling with us. We, they tend to be regarded as solids, but in fact, more often than not, they're about 70% water content. Uh, and it's within that water phase that we find a lot of ammonia, which again, uh, can be utilized within our process and is stabilized by it so that um, it doesn't, it, it isn't volatilized and released into the environment in, in that way. But it also allows us to uh, represent that ammonia in a, in a form that is uh, more available to the plant. Um, but we also get other benefits from the CO2, one of which is that the combination of the chalk that we uh, include in our pelletizing process, one, it actually makes the pelletizing process itself uh, more efficient, but also it seems to uh, mediate the uh, release of the nitrogen from the pellet. So I think that's a combination of essentially we have an organic material there, which is acting as a sponge um, that is and that in combination with the physical nature of the, of the chalk, which it happens in our case to be a uh, very fine particulate material, is, is physically mediating the release, but also the presence of the calcium there tends to ensure that the um, take up of the nitrogen by the plants is better. Um, and if you compare our pelletized materials with those that would be conventionally produced from anaerobic digesters, um, there is a significant bulk reduction that uh, produces transport savings. Um, and because of the sort of increased importance of sustainability in the agricultural sector and the potential of carbon farming and that sort of thing that's coming in, there is now the potential for um, the sort of to actually achieve sales premiums for these pro products, which is something that we certainly didn't envisage four or five years ago. So if we look at just a couple of case studies here of the sort of materials that, or sort of situations that allow us to produce materials for delivery. Um, the first is where we're looking essentially at high volumes of low grade products, uh, where the key importance is stabilization of, of, of the uh, ammonia held in the material, use of the carbon dioxide certainly, but also a significant redu reduction in volume so that that uh, produces significant cost savings for the people who are using the technology. Um, and lastly, a, uh, a, a second higher value precision product where the most important thing is the formulation and the um, efficacy of the product itself and its traceability. So the first one is we're looking at uh, a water treatment application and this relates specifically to a recent deployment of ours which is going on at uh, the, third, the UK's third largest water treatment facility up at Minworth just south of Birmingham and there we're taking ammonia from the waste streams on the site combining that with CO2 uh, which is being taken from a biogas cleanup step that they've got there um, because they're doing a significant uh, export of gas to grid at that system. Um, and then we're using the uh, sludge that's left after their uh, digestion that produces that biogas, combining those materials together to produce what is essentially a 18% a, a, a moisture content pelletized material sort of with a 5N uh, main constituent. And that's being exported to uh, their conventional land spreading our customers um, and we're able to use both the heat generated by our process and that uh, scavenged from other places on the site to um, help dry the material. Whilst in a food waste application which is one that's planned for delivery in the first quarter of next year, it's been slightly delayed because of some issues around the Covid, so, but simply just getting site access and that sort of thing. But here, um, the ammonia is actually being brought into the process, but it again is actually coming from a water treatment cleanup step. The, the CO2 is generated on site, again from a biogas cleanups, um, but the organics are coming from a single stream food waste, particularly um, more the point here, it's, it actually is a food processing factory. So it's, uh, there's often, and it's, 
often the case with a lot of the digestates that they're regarded as dirty materials, and in many cases they are very much so, but it is possible to obtain uh, high purity clean systems, and that's certainly the case here where the waste materials are essentially uh, potato waste, and those materials are being made back into a particular fertilizer formulation, which is being sold by the operators of the plant back to the uh, potato growers who are producing with their producing product for them. So there is a very much a sort of mini circular economy going on around this plant. But the key thing here is that it's the traceability uh, of the, the products and all the inputs into the system that are key to the uh, operator of the plant, but also uh, as the, they are uh, a sort of very large scale operator and the sustainability of their production systems is incredibly important to their consumers. And so, again, it's those two areas that are key to their using the technology. If we look at the system itself, this is a plant that we've had running at our site down in Swindon for the last couple of years. Um, this, again, is a sort of semi-batch operation, runs on about 20 tonnes per day uh, and is able to take a range of feedstocks into it and it's very much a sort of developmental bed for uh, our other deployments. Um, but in its original configuration we were able to export the heat from this system into a pasteuriser uh, that was being used um, on a, a, a mixed waste um, True treatment plant where the, this, the material had to be pasteurized before it could reach its pa appropriate pass standard. Uh, this system is fully automated and essentially uh, it's run largely on gra gravimetric grounds, um, but also we have a considerable amount of um, pH and temperature monitoring to make sure that we're getting to the endpoints on our reactions and also a fair degree of headspace monitoring as well to look, make sure that we've essentially taken our. Uh, getting the right balance between ammonia and CO2 levels. And essentially when the reactions are complete, uh, we get an excess of CO2 coming down, coming through the system and um, all the ammonia levels have gone through the floor. So that's quite good. And during those process, we're capturing around two tons of CO2 a day when it's operating properly. Um, that's not great, but it's really, we need to look at the products themselves. And this isn't just a case of do they work on trials? It's a case of they have to be in a situation where they can work properly as far as the farmers are concerned and delivered by the same equipment. Um, they have to make sure that they're spread properly by that equipment. And what we're seeing here is a simple tray test to make sure that the uh, pellets can be delivered in an equal amount across a certain spread in the field. And in this case is a trial for a 32 meter uh, spread and the materials work well on in these circumstances uh, when delivered with conventional agricultural equipment. So they, they can be used. They do make uh, the crops grow and the nitrogen response is the, exactly the same or if anything slightly better than uh, conventional produced uh, fertilizers, uh, particularly we having sort of lower, lower field losses. Um, and we've had that work carried out by a range of agricultural colleges going back to a six year period now, also at the University of Sheffield and more recently for the last four years by Belcourt, who are a large agronomy uh, and agricultural operator. Um, the crops have been uh, largely grasses, cereals, but also oil seeds and potatoes um, over the last five, now six years. Um, and the yields are very good. And basically we get direct comparisons to um, conventional fertilizers, not only in yield, but also in quality of products. So that's protein content as far as wheats are concerned, that sort of thing. And also the uh, appropriate um, oil contents from the oilseed materials. Um, so uh, the, the products themselves can comply with a range of EU regulations. Uh, the process itself is uh, FIAS registered. Um, we can do so, do producing materials at a competitive price, they can be delivered by existing equipment, and uh, they produce a similar sort of yield. So we have product quality with something that's already there. But in fact, because we include the CO2 in the process and the way that we source our materials, we can actually offer a lot more than that. And so we mentioned earlier these high 
greenhouse gas burdens that uh, are borne by conventional fertilizers. And so with urea and ammonium nitrate produced conventionally, they will produce somewhere between three and a half tons and seven tons of CO2 per ton of, uh, of, of nitrogen that those products contain. Um, and our products have carbon footprints that are significantly less than that. And that again, we, these are figures that are being independently assessed by a range of people other than our good selves. Um, but we're also seeing wider environmental benefits here that again, as I've mentioned the stabilization of ammonia, but we're also getting better nutrient delivery and less volatilization, which is not totally surprising when we're delivering our materials on a, uh, essentially on sponges with chalk in the way as well. But we're also seeing sort of a range of biofauna and flora activity increases uh, along with carbon retention in the soil and uh, enhanced water retention and um, some nice things going on in terms of longer periods to wilt in the plant and that sort of thing. So all going nicely in that sort of direction. Here, uh, it's sort of in, in just a quick graph to show how the more waste material, the, the black ones, which are very above the line are from conventional fertilizer and ammonium nitrate production, the more waste materials we include in our process, uh, the better um, results we see in carbon reduction. And that carbon reduction is being brought about by from three areas. That's a direct capture, uh, so, uh, some sequestration, but also a significant avoidance, partly by the heat we're generating and also through the use of recovered materials. Um, and just as a sort of a, a, a nod to the sort of effect that it might have, if we were producing five, around half a million tonnes of fertiliser by this route, uh, that would obviously produce an avoidance of around 2.7 million tonnes of CO2. So it's like taking two quarter of a million cars off the road and each 10,000 tonne plant, which is sort of standard size for us for the more uh, fertiliser, the, the straight precision fertiliser material size plants, that's going to produce a reduction of 46 million tonnes of CO2 over the lifetime of the plant and significant revenue. So I think that I haven't really said too much about it today because of time restrictions and I realise I'm running over. Um, but the whole point of this, that these are plants that actually produce a real return on investment now without the support of a carbon price. Um, so we're using CO2 to trigger the re-entry of these finite materials back into the economy um, and the products that we produce can com complete on commercial grounds with existing materials and we believe that the process has a significant effect on reducing greenhouse gases and you know most importantly allows us to use resources properly so that's about it for me and just thank you for uh, a lot of help from sort of various companies, our shareholders who paid for much of this work, but also the various grant bodies and um, other businesses that have helped us, particularly Seven Trent, Viridor and the Fiaspor guys. OK, thanks very much indeed. That's brilliant. Thanks very much for such an interesting yeah. presentation, Peter. So My what pleasure. we'd now like to do, <laughs> we'd now like to open the Q&A panel. So could I please ask all speakers to turn on their webcam? OK, great. So just to let the audience know, we have got a lot of questions today and we may not have time to get through them all, but we're certainly going to try our best. So the first question is from Paul Winstanley, who has asked, how big do CO2 supply plants need to be to match supply to demand? Is there a sweet spot in balancing supply and demand between CO2 producers and CO2 takers? Do we have any volunteers who would like to speak first on this? I, I, yeah, I, I think, if, if I may, I think there's probably yeah, multiple yeah. answers to that. But yeah. uh, certainly in our case, what we try and do is uh, match the production of our plant to maximise the resources available at the time. Now, we happen to have the sweet spot for us is if we base our operating systems on a, um, a green, a, a biogas generating unit, it so happens that the match between, well, the limiting factor for us isn't the supply of the CO2, it's the supply of the post-digestate material. 
and we can use all that material which has to go into our products because we get lots of nutrients and goodies from it but there is always then an excess of co2 available either from the combustion burn or the gas cleanup as the travel route goes so we're fine on that um and in most cases i i think that there's the point source is it's rare that the utilization people are having a shortage of co2 it intends when we speak to clients, most of the people would want us to use more, to be honest, and I don't know what the others feel about that. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's not just a question of how much, but the purity uh, pressure and other factors as well. So mm. every process will will have a, a, a specification, and uh, obviously people would rather have 100% pure carbon dioxide than 10% carbon dioxide and 90% nitrogen. If you need, if your if your utilization process needs to operate at 50 bar pressure, well, it's much more attractive to have a source of waste carbon dioxide at 50 bar than have to do the pressurization yourself. You've got to think about continuity of supply, security of supply. Um, so generally, yes, I would agree that as a user, you would want to have more available than you need, and then if one bit of supply goes down for whatever reason, then you, you you're not going to be short. Yeah, I was just saying, I don't think there is a, a simple answer to that because it's 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 applying the right uh, scale in the right context, limited by feedstock, uh, the technology. If you have a very large scale polymer plant or something and the opportunity to, to, to co-locate a BEX plant to it, then that might work very well at large scale and other things will be restricted and be much more distributed. Thank you very much for your thoughts on that. I will move on to the next question. And this question was from Yosef Stanton, who has asked, given the immediate and urgent near term need to address the critical challenge of climate change, how should we manage short, uh, short retention time options such as fuels? Should we value retention time, especially over the next 10 to 30 years? I think yes, because you've got to look at what you're displacing. So we are going to need fuel full stop from somewhere. So is it better to get that fuel from carbon dioxide? Yeah. Yes, you might then immediately burn that cut that fuel again and generate regenerate the carbon dioxide. But at least that gives you the potential to leave the coal or the crude oil or the natural gas in the ground, which has got to be a better solution than burning the coal to produce <coughs> carbon dioxide and then burying the carbon dioxide in the ground. Yeah, yeah so, I, I couldn't agree. Sorry. No, go on, Peter. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more with that. I, I think it's, I've, I've often heard the analogy before, half is full, but actually the best thing you can do is not just empty, it's actually turn the tap. So, you know, that, that, that is key to what Michael's saying there. And also, I think probably once you actually, the, the, the thing at the moment is we're not really recognising um, or attributing any value to processes that save carbon. And any steps that we take however faltering to start off with, that start to attribute some sort of value to new pro so new, new technologies that are lower carbon at least, they might not be perfect solutions, but as easy gets them out there, that will allow uh, the establishment of frameworks by which longer and better terms of carbon attenuation can be recognized. But you've got to start somewhere. And at the moment we've got, but anything is good news at the moment. So, what challenges will there be in ensuring the public sees CCUS in the next decade as a great thing to do? How do we bring the public along with us, um, for example, and avoid a biofuels type backlash? I don't there, know. there are a number of different strategies to do. I think first and foremost, it's about continuous engagement uh, with the public at every step of the way. Um, and the earlier that engagement happens, the better. And it's not necessarily the case. It, it, it's not still not quite that simple. It's not necessarily the case that if they have all the information to hand, that they will still be more supportive. And there's been numerous studies across a number of different technologies that have proven that to be the case. But it is generally helpful if they, they know um, as much about the technology as possible. It's, it's also a question of trust. It's, it's being given the opportunity to ask questions, to get to know who the implementers are, who the funders are, where will these um, technologies uh, or the plants um, be located? So proximity to um, 
uh, to plants has proven to be quite important. It's not necessarily, and again, it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll either be really supportive or quite negative. Um, it does vary depending on the technology, but also depending on the broader context. So if they're already within a, a largely industrial landscape, they might be more welcoming of a new plant but if they're you know living in a national park or near in in beautiful green landscape and then something like that is is proposed to be introduced it might be a little bit more difficult but i think one of the key things to remember is to acknowledge where there are uncertainties or um, unknowns is to be honest about those um, and to keep that dialogue open and ongoing and not to pretend that everything uh, will run smoothly, that everything is going to deliver in the way that they, um, it's said to be delivered. Um, and also, I think it's, it's about addressing local communities' concerns and values. So what, what is the context? And I think context is a really important point here of this community. Uh, is it um, downgraded in terms of socioeconomic terms? And so is there something that this um, uh, implementing a plant in that area might be able to contribute in terms of helping uh, the community and engaging in those sorts of conversations? And I know Kevin's been through some of this um, himself and can probably speak to this um, from a uh, uh, from a person of experience, having um, dealt with those communities around the, the Q Technologies plant at Wensbury. Um, so I think the, there are many important steps to take, but it's about continuous engagement um, and building up those trusted relationships. Hmm. Yeah, I would just very briefly add is, is I think, uh, I mean, you know, reflecting on our experiences of developing various plant locations is, is if you have a relatively compact technology with minimal impact, you have a numerous potential locations you can choose from. And thus you choose the ones where uh, people want the plant to be, they want the jobs. Uh, and they want the location to be. So rather than trying to force something on a, you know, dealing with, with, with objection. So once we've developed, we've had no, you know, complete support of all the way. And you can do that if it's, uh, you know, in a more compact, those first stage um, iterations. But having said that, of course, there are costs, you know, in some of our industrial clusters in, in the country, very large brownfield industrial sites that welcome that would absolutely welcome very large plants and, and would, would just have uh, you know uh, universal support in terms of providing um, solid long-term jobs. The only thing I would add to that is don't forget the next generation as well. I think there's a lot to be said for edu you know, getting things into the school curriculum um, and educating people uh, at, at, at GCSE level and below. Um, I, I still remember that when I was doing O levels, it was a standard part of the chemistry O level curriculum that planet Earth was so enormous that there was absolutely nothing that mankind could do to affect it in any way. And that we could dump all the gases we wanted into the atmosphere, they'd be diluted down to zero. Mm -hmm. We could dump all our waste into the oceans, it would get diluted mm -hmm. down to zero. And the sur surface was so big, we could dump all the solid we wanted and it would just, we would just vanish. If that's what you're going to teach children, don't be surprised when we have problems in 40, 50, 60 years time. However, uh, I would just, sorry, I would just add to that point. Um, there's there's quite a bit of um, social science literature too, particularly around wind farms here in the UK, onshore uh, wind farms, that demonstrates even though you might have a quite environmentally or climate change minded community, they could still object to the location of a wind farm, uh, if it's near to them, if there isn't that uh, build up of trust and engagement from the very beginning. So if it's seen to be enforced upon them, they're still not going to be very welcoming. Um, so it's, it, I agree that, that what you're saying is, is valid, the education about environmental awareness and climate change is important, but it still uh, requires more work than just that. Thank you. So I think we've got time for one last question. And this is from Sam Bartlett, who has asked, as we move towards a circular economy, how do the panelists see the CO2 supply chain working? For example, how does the responsibility for any necessary purification sit in the chain? You know, that's actually a really complicated question. And um, 
we've actually just just appointed um, a new um, lecturer in law here in, in York, and, and his interests are in the legal aspects of the circular economy. Because at the moment, the, the whole really of global law, not just UK and, and EU law, is based around a linear economy. That if you buy a product in a store and it's salty, you don't have to go back to the original supplier. You take it back to the store, they supply it, they give it back to the person they bought it from, and it goes back up the supply chain. What happens if that's a circular economy and then suddenly this faulty product ends up back with you? Because it was your waste that was used to, to build it in the first place. So who's ultimately responsible? And the, there's no scientific answer to that. We need to change the laws. We, we need a separate set of laws to cut to govern the circular economy. And that really, I think, is one of the things that government really has to take on board and action before we can before we can make much more sig significant progress in this area. I see it's more, I, I'm not looking that far ahead to be honest, it's more just in terms of uh, um, integration with industries or other uh, other technology providers in, in small discrete integrated uh, uh, routes. I think, you know, the, the, the time for sort of trading it a, a longer distance, I think is, is a bit further away. I, th I think where we need to be starting is, uh, is co-location in industries where you would have the normal, uh, um, you know, customer supply relationship over that particular specification. Um, you know, for that for that scenario. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you very much to our speakers for the time in the Q and A session and for sharing your insights. And finally, to summarise, on behalf of everyone, I would just like to express sincere thanks to all of today's speakers and their insights via the Q and A panel, and also thank thank you to everyone who's helped make today's event a success. And we hope to see you all again at the next events. And with that, I would now like to draw this webinar to a close. Thank you all for attending.